Cool. Alright, let's do this. Uh, I am Ben Edmonds. Today we'll be talking about modern and secure PHP. The talk jumps around a little bit. It's kind of a fast-paced talk. We're going to go through basically what's new in PHP over the past few years, um, kind of PHP 5.3 and up, and then we'll cover some brief things on building a secure application, kind of some basics of what you should go through as you first develop an application. It's mostly kind of an intro for people that, it's kind of geared towards people that haven't used PHP much recently, or maybe you've poked around in it, but you haven't really delved deep. It, um, a lot of people get a bad um, vibe from PHP because PHP 4 and kind of early 5 days, it's really sloppy, really just throw some stuff together and let's see how it works. It wasn't really well architected, people didn't follow patterns or testing, anything like that. In recent years, it's really had a resurgence of, hey, let's do this right, let's use some software patterns, let's do some unit testing, and PHP has really grown as a language and a community into a very modern language. I'm Ben Edmonds on Twitter. BenEdmonds.com is my blog if you want to check me out after this. Um, blog, I never update, so it's kind of pointless anyway. Twitter, I'm fairly active on, and if you have any questions or if you want to just chat later, feel free to hit me up on there. I would love to chat. I do uh, open source work. I have a book, um, Building Secure PHP Apps, which I'll throw a coupon code for you later to try to make some money. And I do the PHP Town Hall podcast with my buddy Phil Sturgeon. He's the angry British guy on Twitter, you might know. And I'm a CTO of Mindfulware. We do medical and insurance software, do a lot of PHP and Node work. Let's jump in. We're going to cover exceptions, closures, namespaces, static, short arrays, PDO, and security a little bit. We're also going to dig into some of the tools that PHP has available now. In the past, a lot of the tools were with, you know, so Ruby or Python were well known for having good tools and infrastructure. PHP has that now, so we're going to cover a little bit about what we have there. That's going to be mostly the built-in web server now for development, composer and package management with that, and then a little bit on unit testing. All right, exceptions. What happens when things go wrong, right? So here we have a try catch block. We're going to do try to do some code, and then if it does not work properly, we're going to catch it and do something with the error. So this is a really simple, stupid example. Here we have uh, try, and then we just have a comment. Your code goes here. This could be whatever your code is. You're going to do something, and inside that code, you're going to throw an exception, and that's just a PHP object. You can see it defined there, exception E, and we're going to map that to our E variable. So we're going to catch that, we're going to return it back, and then we have E as our exception object. In this case, we're just doing a die, and then E get message. So all that does is it pulls through the exception object, and then it's going to run get message on that, and we're going to pull out the message where the error was. This is a very simple example of what it just looks like to catch and handle an exception. Most modern libraries you use nowadays with PHP will throw exceptions when they hit errors. Kind of back in the day, what you used to do is you would say, if this succeeded, if this returned true, or if some proprietary success message equaled whatever, then we know it worked OK. Else, we fall back to error handling. Nowadays, what you're going to do is you're just going to try to do whatever it is, and then that class, when it hits an error, is going to throw an exception. It can have different types. It can extend the exception class to do different things to say, hey, I am a PO exception, I'm a HTTP request exception, whatever the exact exception is for the object, and then you can catch the different types. So here we're just doing a general exception, but we can also catch certain types of exceptions and then handle those properly. So it gives us a more fine-grained control. We don't have to have proprietary documentation and success error messages. We have a API across all our libraries that we use, and we already know how to handle them at the most basic level. We can use documentation to get more exact, more precise with the exceptions, but either way, we know how to handle when something goes wrong. Closures. So this is, uh, closures are what JavaScript's kind of known for in our PHP world. We now have them in PHP. 
which a closure is an anonymous function that you do something with, that you return some value with, you affect the outside world with, right? This means we don't have to name the function to do something with it. In this case, this is a pretty basic example from like a routing class. Here we're doing a route get, and then we're passing through just forward slash. So that means when we hit the forward slash on a URL, what are we going to do with that? In this case, we're passing in function, and then we're doing something with that. This is a, an example from Laravel, actually. So this function is not named. I, I, this is just for Paul. I was hoping he would join, right? Um, this function is not named. It's not anywhere else. It's not a class. It's just right here. It's encapsulated in this file. We're returning the function, and then we're doing something with it. Does this look familiar from JavaScript, probably, if you've done that, or if you've done recent PHP? Any other uh, Java modern languages have it. The idea here is that we're going to keep the logic contained, we're going to act on it within this function, and then we're going to get out of it. This is not something we're going to use other places. This doesn't mean you should do this everywhere. A lot of people get into the habit of, they're like, oh, so it's, it's really easy to just use this closure here. I'm going to throw it in. The problem with this is that you can't reuse really it. It's just stuck here. Um, so it's not good for dry, it's not good for object-oriented programming. It's kind of a quick and dirty, we're going to do something with this, and we're going to keep it contained, and then we're going to move on. So don't overuse it, but it does have a great use for when you need it. Namespaces. One problem as applications mature and grow, so a Laravel example, um, you have, let's say you have classes, in this case named command. You use this thread application, and then you use a library or a framework, and oh shit, it has the same class, and now we have um, duplication, and we can't use both the same names in the same places because you don't know where you're going to pull it from, or you have to make sure you only require it in this one place and not in the other place. This is where namespaces come in. So namespaces give us a container for our classes and our objects. So in this case, we're saying namespace eliminate console, and then we have the class command. So in this, command exists under this namespace, under this container, and then we can only use it in that context. We can say use eliminate console, and then we can use just command there, because we know we've set that context of we're using this container, this namespace. Um, this solves the problem of having the same names in multiple places. It also gives you nice um, containerized objects to see, OK, so everything dealing with this is under this namespace. I know where to access it. And it just keeps it all very nice and clean. You don't have to worry about stepping over yourself or over the libraries you use. Statics. Statics are way overused in PHP right now, in my opinion. They do have their place. They are a nice shortcut syntax for a lot of things, but they shouldn't be used everywhere. Um, we kind of saw a, a surge of usage when it first came out, where, oh, we have statics now, we're just going to use statics for everything. Um, Fuel PHP did this pretty hardcore when it first came out. Uh, Code Natter dipped his toes in it, and it's just like everything was a static for no reason. Just because the language comes out with a new feature doesn't mean we need to use it to death. The way static looks is we're going to define a class, and then we have public static function. So in this case, we have a router, and then our function here is a get. So this is a play on the example we used earlier with the closure. This would be the class that that uses. The advantage here is that we can call this without instantiating the object. So we're able to call this get function through the route class without instantiating it. So we don't have to do var route equals new route, and then route get, right? So we can just quickly call it through that. We keep it all contained inside this one class. The real disadvantage here, without some kind of hacky work, you don't have the state. That's, that's both an advantage and a disadvantage. The reason it's a disadvantage a lot of times is because people use it when they want state, and then they end up hacking around themselves to give themselves state inside of static. You're not supposed to track state inside statics. The point of it is so that you can quickly call a function through a class. Um, and we'll get into the semantic pattern and stuff like that. But basically, most of the time you want to use it, it's going to be just you need to use this method inside this class without tracking a full state of an object. If you need to track state of an object over time, you'll want to instantiate it. And then you can call methods on it, 
and then that object retains those variables, the methods that you call, and then it retains that over time. The, uh, the key here is that you're calling static function instead of just function when you define it, and then instead of using an error to access it, you're going to use the double colon, and that's your key in PHP, that this is the syntax for a static. Like I said, you don't have state, so you don't have access to the this that you usually have inside a class in PHP. So usually in PHP, if you want to access a variable, you just do this arrow variable name, and you can access that, and the class retains that as you modify it through the lifetime of the class. In static, you don't have that. There are a couple ways to get around it. Um, when I say get around it, it's kind of a strong term. We have a couple of different scopes here. We have self and we have static. So self is the variable at the time of the definition. So when we define this class, the variable was whatever this exists with self. Static is the variable at execution. So if we modify variables, um, static is going to be where they were when we called it, whereas self will be when it was originally defined. Uh, it seems like a small difference, but it will really uh, hurt you if you don't use it properly. Next up is shorter arrays. Um, this is uh, not a big deal at all, but it's kind of exciting just because it's pretty. So before we had array equals array, and it's kind of a verbose way to define an array. Now we can just use this quick little shortcut of a square bracket and define arrays wherever we need them. It's also nice if you're defining, say, like an empty array or a new array at the top of your objects. You just do, you know, double square brackets and you have an array. Now, I'm going to point this out not because it's a, a life-changing language feature, but for one, it's going to break older code. So I believe this was introduced in 5.4. So if you uh, try to use it with PHP 5.3 on some production server somewhere or whatever, it's going to break. So be on the lookout for that. I see that quite often. Somebody tries to pull in a new library, but they're on like a 5.3 server and then it breaks. Also, just so you know what it is when you see it. Traits are a new thing for PHP, well, fairly new, probably three years old now, um, which is new in PHP land because we're very slow to change. It gives you grouping without strict inheritance. So a normal object is going to give you inheritance. So you say this object extends X and you're going to follow that path of inheritance down through your classes, right? Traits uh, give you the grouping of that, but without that strict inheritance. So let's just kind of walk through. It's hard to explain without seeing code. So here we have base user, and then we have the get name method. And then this would probably hit a database or whatever you wanted to do with it. Um, maybe mutate an object. Here we're just going to return a string just to show that the method's returning just a name, right? Now we also have a admin user. So instead of extending this where we would inherit everything from that, in this case we're just going to do a use. So we use base user. That's what base user looks like. We have the get name method. You have whatever your basic user methods are in there. Then we have an admin user who uses that. So that's basically like it's going to require all those methods and throw them in that class without pulling through any inheritance from that base object. That base object could have changed things over time if you, if you implemented it somewhere else in your code. But if you just use it, you're just throwing those methods in there, basically. So now our admin user, we're going to define as new user. And then we're just going to do echo admin user get name. And then we get John Snow. So you see admin user and no point had get name defined. We just hit use. But because the base user did, we're able to use that just like it exists. Um, try to think through when you use traits, like, hey, so I need to group these things together, but this isn't a cohesive object that I need to inherit across my objects. Um, this is just, these things are contained, these things are exist. I don't want to throw a get name function into every user class, because that's, that's not dry, that's repeating myself. That's somebody's going to change one of them and not the other, and then my code base is going to be out of sync. There's lots of reasons why you want to use the same code throughout but you wouldn't want to inherit that because maybe you're using that base user somewhere else as well. So here we're just grouping those methods together and we're reusing them. All right, PDO is a fairly recent, and by recent, that's probably five years old, um, database driver, handler in PHP. It's built in now. 
It's a way to handle databases cross system. We don't have to have MySQL functions. We don't have to have Postgres functions. We can use PDO and then trust that it will use across the databases. You could use MySQL local, Postgres on your production environment. You could start out with MySQL in production and maybe, maybe you need uh, geospatial functions that MySQL doesn't have and so you need to use PostGIS. And so you upgrade your production databases to Postgres. Because you use PDO, you're able to easily transition from MySQL to Postgres without rewriting every one of your models. It doesn't actually work with Mongo, but I thought it was funny, so I threw it in. Um, all right, it's cross-system. So these are the most popular systems that support. I'm sure it supports more than this. These are just the ones I pulled out to show because you're most likely using one of these. It adds safe binding, which we'll show you what that is right here. So here we're preparing a statement, and then we're going to bind a parameter to that. So in this case, we're preparing a SQL query with an ID, and then we're going to bind that ID to a variable. This means we don't have to worry about escaping that within our code. We don't have to concat strings, anything like that. It'll handle it all for us. Security, that's a... We're going to go through a bit of what's PHP, what PHP has added in security. We're going to go through SQL injection, HTTPS, password hashing, authentication, safe defaults, and then some common hacks of uh, XSS and CSRF. All right, so here we're going to circle back a little bit to PDO to show you the security implementation implementation there. Here we're binding the ID as we discussed. This means that you're not going to be able to just pass through any query. This is going to protect you from SQL injection. If say that ID came from a URL, somebody can't modify the URL to something else and then change the structure of your SQL queries, it's going to always be contained inside that ID field. That doesn't mean you can't have a bad query by any means, but it means you won't be SQL injection injected in that query. Uh, anytime you have output to the screen, you should um, protect that. You should escape that. There's two main ways that um, people get hacked. Um, hack's kind of a strong word. So you either save data you shouldn't save, or you show data you shouldn't sh should not show. Um, in this case, we're covering at the top here how to save the data properly. You also want to make sure when you redisplay it, you escape it back out. Somebody could have saved some JavaScript code in like a text field, and then if you redisplay that back to the screen without proper escaping, that's going to just execute in the browser. And you don't want arbitrary JavaScript executing in the browser. That user has a session, that user has sensitive data possibly in that browser session, and you don't want just JavaScript sending that data anywhere or modifying that user's session and state. There are other uh, ways of escaping data on output. This is the only one I'm going to cover because this is one you're going to use 90% of the time. You should do a little research yourself to see, okay, so this is my use case, this is the kind of data I have, and this is um, how I should escape that. Again, 90% of the time you're going to just going to use HTML entities. HTTPS, uh, you might have heard of HTTPS everywhere. So it was an initiative a couple years back so that every page we go to should use HTTPS, and that's kind of the goal of the project. Traditionally, only like shopping carts, um, a lot of login pages didn't even use HTTPS, just shopping carts did for a while. Nowadays, most login pages do at least, so that way when you put in a username and password, it's going over a secure tunnel, uh, say pipe 443 in your browser. You'll see the little lock symbol in your browser, you know. Um, that means that the data is uh, encrypted end to end, so you're not passing through just plain text passwords or usernames over that connection. It's also pretty recommended that unless you have a reason not to, just do your whole site over HTTPS. It takes a very small performance hit, and the only performance hit is with the initial content negotiation. So when you first go to that site, it says, hey, are you who I think you are? Do you have the right certifications? Okay, your certificate is good. We're going to establish a connection. Boom, you're done. So it's a very, very small performance hit on that HTTP request. But the advantage is that you don't have plain text, um, possibly secure data transmitted through your site. It's also required by OAuth 2, so that's um, kind of pushing usage a bit as well. OAuth 1 had some 
uh, kind of implementations in place where you didn't have to have HTTPS, but you really went around your ass to make it work. A lot too was just threw that out, and now you just have to use HTTPS. Another thing you should always do is access control. You see this a lot in kind of newer apps or ones that were just kind of thrown together. If the user can see a link, a lot of times people assume they have access to use that link. So let's say you let them into some kind of admin page. Just because they were able to find that admin page doesn't mean that they have access to it. You might have uh, access control in your view that says don't show them the edit users link unless they're an admin. What if they find that somehow? Or what if uh, someone sends them a link, something like that? Whether you load that route, whenever they go to that page, you should also double check their access to make sure they do have access to do whatever they're doing on that page. Anytime they do an admin function or edit something, you should double check because you can't trust that just because the user's on the page, they're authorized to see it. Another thing to make sure you keep in mind is when you're doing any type of login, make sure you protect against brute forcing. The easiest way to hack passwords and hack sites is to just brute force. You just try a million logins until you find it because people reuse passwords and people use pretty basic passwords. You want to always have something in place where you check to see how many times they've tried to log in and then stop them for so long. So maybe you get five tries in 60 seconds and then you're locked out for 60 seconds. Or you get one try every 30 seconds. You want to do something so that you can't hit it a million times within an hour. You want to make sure that you have to spread out your login attempts there. Also, it's a good idea to check against IP. So if the same IP hits you a million times on a login, you can be pretty confident somebody's trying to hack in. There's not a million users from one IP hitting that. The new thing in PHP 5.5 is password hashing built in. This has been a very dangerous part of our community, is that everyone thinks that they have the best uh, password hashing, login, authentication methods. They think they can write the algorithms themselves. Um, you should not do any type of security work yourself unless you know what you're doing, right? Any type of algorithm work. Your password hashing should use an accepted industry standard. Those are in place for a reason. So PHP now has the password hash and password verify built in. This will hash your logins for you in a secure format. So right now the accepted standard is bcrypt. It will encrypt your passwords with bcrypt. It will salt them and you can store that in your database as the hash and know that it's safe. What this will do with your passes in. So here we're doing post pass. So, so the user typed in their password. It's going to go through, you're going to call password hash, and it's going to return back a hash string. The string is going to be both your hashed password that includes the salt, and then it's going to be appended with the salt in the same string. That way you can combine that hash and that salt later to log back in. You don't have to worry about that though, because PHP now has password verify as well. And so you're just going to call that on the password. Here the user's typing in their password. And then that you, we're just using to represent the object that we pulled from the database. So we're going to throw in both what the user typed and then our hash string from the database. And then we can log in that user if they verify. It also includes some handy functions for um, checking if you need to rehash. So password rehash will tell you if, hey, so I had bcrypt before, but now the standards changed to this updated bcrypt or um, you know, we go to something new. We go to xcrypt in the future we can know that it needs to be rehashed without affecting our user's ability to log in. All right, here's another example. You should always use safe defaults as you define your application. So you don't want to just have variables defined inside a loop or later on in your application. If you're going to use a variable inside a class, you want to define it at the start of that class. Kind of CS101, but a lot of people miss out on this. This will, one, give you context of what kind of data type that should be, what variables you're going to be dealing with, and it will also mean that you're not going to try to say for each on an array that doesn't exist and then throw is set or errors in your PHP code. Here we just an example of we're setting something equals false because false is the default value, and then later we're going to check it to see if it equals something else before we set it. Again, really basic. All right, a couple very basic hacks that you'll see used on sites is XSS and CSRF. 
In this case, this, uh, we're going to show it non-persistent XSS. So that's cross-site scripting is what that stands for. If you were to throw something in this URL, that shouldn't exist. Here, we're just having some pagination. So it's just page num equals whatever. But you can't be sure that the user won't change that. So if you were, say, saving these values straight to a database or using them back in your site, you can't be sure that this hasn't changed. You just want to keep this in mind as you architect your site. You can't trust anything that comes from a user. No data that comes from a user can be trusted because somebody could have changed that. Persistent cross-site scripting is the same idea, except it's saved to a database. So if somebody's able to save that data into your database by just, say, sending someone a link, whatever. Again, you just want to make sure you escape and you don't trust any data that comes from the user. Here's a way of showing protecting that. So here we're just showing something back on a screen. Like I mentioned earlier, if somebody were to say JavaScript, so if they would have put JavaScript through this URL, or if they would have saved it to the database, and then we show it back out to a user, this is going to execute in the user's browser unless we escape it. And then that user could have a session. So say that user is an admin, and you throw some JavaScript in there to click a delete user link. If you're able to get that admin to execute that page without um, escaping it, you can have JavaScript that clicks a delete link in somebody's user account. right? Um, but if you skip that properly, it won't execute the JavaScript. It'll just show up as text. Cross-site request forgery is similar, but you're, here you're going to say, we're deleting this user. You don't, you don't delete the user unless they have an active session, right? So unless this is an admin that has the ability to delete the user and they have an active session, you wouldn't usually do this. The difference here is that we're just passing it through in URL. So all I've got to do is get that admin to click that link, and then it's going to execute in their session in their browser and perform that action. So let's say I, I name the link something else. So I name view user, and I send that to you. If you click it in your admin, but it actually goes to this URL, that user is going to be deleted. You don't want to let that happen. You don't want to let people do things that they're not planning to happen. The way you really protect against that is that you put it behind some type of form. So you should expect it to be posted or put or something like that to perform that action, and then you have to make sure that that user actually requested it. You can't just put it behind a form because somebody could curl, so do a curl call to it to post that data to it. You gotta make sure that it existed from that user. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna generate a token, just a one-time use token, when we display the form. So we're displaying a delete user form. Are you sure you wanna delete this user? But it has this one-time use token inside the form, and then when you submit that, we're gonna check to make sure that, that token is valid. That's the token we expected so that we did initiate this and then we followed through the same user, the user that has access to do this. Here we're just going to do um, generating token. It's just a, we're just using dev view random to generate a random token. Then we want to store that in the session. Uh, we're storing in flash data, which uh, most frameworks have some type of implementation of flash data, which is just a one-time use session data. Once you pull it out of the session, it's going to automatically be deleted. That's not building with PHP. If you wanted to re-implement that in PHP, you just say, pull this from the session and then delete it right after you use it. Um, that's all flash data is. And then we're going to return the token. So this is something we would use inside our form. So we'd say, define the form, hidden input, and then we're going to generate that. When that form submitted, we're going to pull back and check that. So they submitted to whatever page. We're going to check that the token that was submitted in the post equals the token that was in the session. So we just want to match them up to make sure the user requested this, the user acted on it, and it was the same person. All right, let's go over a little bit of the tools available in PHP nowadays. So, like I said, we're no longer just uh, the hack stuff together kind of group. We actually have legitimate development tools and standards that we're using. Some of the cooler recent tools in PHP uh, the built-in web server. So now if you're going to do development, you don't have to set up a full-on Apache or Nginx environment on your local for each project. You can just CD into your project directory and run this command, and it's going to boot up a local instance of the PHP server pointed to that folder. So this is great, especially if you do any kind of freelancing or agency work. You just CD into your project. You're probably jumping projects all day. You go into that project, you boot up the server, and boom, you have an instance of that available. 
if you do JavaScript, because it's a JavaScript conference, you might, um, this is say like Gulp Serve or something like that you might use, where you're used to just going to a directory and booting up a server that runs it. This is kind of PHP's version of that, where you're just booting up a local server. Question? No, HD access is just an Apache thing. Yeah. So this is an alternative. And to be clear, this is not something you'd want to use in production. This does not replace Apache or Nginx. This is just uh, just development, something quick and easy to use. Composer, yet another package manager for PHP. The main difference here from, say, like um, Peckle or some of the older stuff that was available to us, like Pear, is um, for one, it has very good version control. It also manages packages based on JSON files, so it's a little easier to get in and out. You don't have to compile things into your install or use some weird arcane um, storage location. It's all GitHub, Git, um, and uses Git repos to store. It's also pretty modern. So part of the real appeal of Composer is that it's the new standard, so it has newer packages on it. It has usually higher quality because it's new. It's not all a technology issue. It's not all that the technology is so much better, although it's more modern. It's also that it's where, where the community is now. You want to be where the community is and track that as the polls. I was a long time fair user. One of the terrible things about fair was that you had no application specific installation process. Your installations of fair were always system wide. As a composer, as per application uh, package management, has been absolutely absolutely. Yeah, so I'll repeat that for the recording. Um, Paul is saying that he used to be a pretty big pair user, and the real issue there is that you have to set it up globally. Um, the real advantage of Composer here is that it's per project. So similar to like NPM, you have a project defined um, packages. So inside your project, you have composer.json, and you're defining the packages for that project. So it gives you a nice encapsulation between different projects where they have their own things, and you don't have to just have all your project or all your packages across all your projects like Pear did. Uh, it also has a nice auto loading built in. So with PHP, you can just say, hey, I want to use this class. You just call the class, instantiate it, and it's going to go look it up and auto load the file for you if it was loaded through Composer. The um, nice thing there is you don't have to say, like, require four levels deep directories this one file. It just figures it out for you because it's using a standard of the auto loading across all the packages. Uh, Packages.org is an implementation of Composer, and it's kind of the, the main repository location. You can have your own um, servers. It's not just limited to Packages, but Packages is where you probably want to go if you're looking for something. The JSON file looks like this. So here we're just doing require, we're doing Stripe and Twilio. And here we're doing dev master. This is probably something you don't want to use in development. For production, you'd want to define specific versions so you know what version you're pulling down. You can also have different versions for, um, you can have require dev. And so for your development environment, you can get the newest, latest and greatest. And for your production environments, you can have specific versions set. It also has a, a lock file that says, OK, so this is what we pulled down. We can commit up our lock file which isn't all of our packages. We don't have to commit everything we've done to our repo. We just commit the lock file, which is like a, a snapshot of these are what we have at this time in these versions. Then when you get to your server, you just update based on that lock file, and it's going to pull down those exact versions. Gives you a really nice version control system where you don't have to just commit everything to all your repos as well. What that looks like is update and install. So here we're using the FAR. You can also install it. You can install it to your project, or you can install it globally on your system. Um, for this example, the easiest one is just you download the composer.far file, and then you run it with PHP like that. What it looks like to pull that in is just client equals new services Twilio, and this is where the auto loading comes in. So it's going to go look up where that file is based on the directories and the, the pattern there. It's going to require it for you, and it's going to be immediately available. So you don't have to worry about where is this stored exactly under the vendor folder or anything like that. You just instantiate it, and it's going to look it up. 
And then we can just use that. So here's just an example of using the client. Unit testing, we're just going to shortly touch on this. Unit testing is really growing in PHP. PHP for a long time just ignored it. It's like, oh, unit testing is not a thing. That's some, some weird enterprise software thing or whatever. But now the community has really embraced it and seen the advantages here. The great thing about unit testing is you can say, hey, so I expect my code to do X. How do I know it did X? How do I know it's correct? With the unit test, we're going to pro programmatically check that to make sure that our code did in fact do X and it did X properly. And then in the future, as we use that code everywhere, or as we implement our application, we can feel safe and secure in knowing that it's working properly. Also gives us the advantage of, hey, so this code kind of sucks and I use this or whatever. We need to refactor this. But this is pretty core cool to our business. If we refactor this, it can be kind of scary. What if we mess it up, right? If you have the unit test for that, you can run the test to see if it still passes, to see if the, the end result is still what you expect. But you can refactor that to be more performant or to be cleaner or to whatever. And then you just run the unit test on it and you know that you didn't break it. You know that it still works properly even though you rewrote it. It also gives you a nice goal to shoot for. So as you're refactoring that, you're running the test and you know, hey, this isn't right yet. I need to fix it. This isn't right yet. I need to fix it. And instead of hoping that you or the QA team finds everything wrong with it, you already have validated tests that work. It's great for refactoring. It's the best thing. There's several different tools for unit testing. Um, some of the more popular ones, PHP unit, Behat. Um, I'm also a big fan of Codeception. It gives you both unit testing and acceptance testing. But whatever you want to use there. Uh, Selenium I threw in just because a lot of people know it. That's not strict unit testing. That's actually more acceptance testing. So that just kind of follows the user path. PHP unit is by far the most popular in PHP. And that's going to actually unit test blocks your PHP code. So here we have a little example of uh, the PHP unit test. We're just going to include the PHP unit framework. We have an API test. And then we're going to implement test verify. So test verify is going to call this in and then it's going to make sure it does what it expects. It's not really doing anything here, but you can see off and then we're going to do verify. So we're just making sure we can verify the user. Um, and then here we're just asserting true. So we're making sure that it's returning a uh, balloon that is true, right? Um, the real example here, here is that you can do assert true, true, assert false. You can also check types. You can check the basics of all your objects, all your classes, everything you expect your application to do to make sure it is actually performing what you expect it to perform. Not just the result. You, can, you want to actually test your units. So you can say each library that I'm using throughout this does exactly what I expect the library to do. Each method does exactly what I expect it to do. Things like that. So you're testing all your units, and then you know when you put the larger piece together that your units are correct. Paul? Sure. You got a point? No. Alright, so this is what it looks like when you run it. So PHP unit test, and then it's just going to run all your tests with this command. You can also run specific ones. This one will just run them all. Then it's going to give you a little output for, hey, did it pass? In this case, we had one test and one assertion, and it passed. So we're good. All right, we're out of time. So a few resources if you want to learn more about what's current in PHP, if you want to get a little more modern. PHP.net is a great website. It's recently been redesigned. It shows you everything that's new with PHP, and it's very current. It's not static. It's not old. It's very up to date with the times. Also, I recommend checking out some of the newer frameworks. Um, if you pull up these frameworks and you see how they do things, you can also read through the code bases. You'll learn a lot just by seeing how other people have done it. All, all these frameworks here do things in very different ways, but you can see patterns that go throughout. You can also see the tools and the, the newer things they use from PHP. You'll learn a lot just by reading through that. And PHP the Right Way is both a book on LeanPub and a website. The website is completely free. The book, I think, is a couple bucks, and it's just a, like a donation. This is kind of opinionated, but it's kind of leaders in PHP, modern PHP, showing you this is how we do things now. So if you need to handle, say, form validation, it'll be what's the best modern way to handle this now? Again, it's opinionated, 
but it will show you a good way to do most of the basic things you're going to do in an application. I highly recommend checking this out. You'll learn a ton and it gets good advice. There's nothing on here that's um, like PHP classes where it's 10 years old. Everything on here is going to be new updated information. Then a little shout out uh, my book, Build Secure PHP Apps. Use the coupon code ConnectJS. Um, you can just use this URL down here. You'll get five bucks off, 20% off. And it covers the security aspects we talked about and a lot more in depth. All right, again, I'm Ben Edmonds on Twitter, benedmonds.com. That joined in is wrong. Also, that coupon code is wrong. My bad. Uh, QA time. Who has a question? All right. If anyone has any questions, if you want to talk any more later, again, I, I'm interested in PHP. There are a lot of nodes, stuff like that. So I'd love to chat about any of that. Also, if you have any questions about anything I covered and want to dig deeper, feel free to grab me. I'll be hanging out around here, packing up, and then I'll be around all day in the conference. Thank you.